Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Around the Room. I'm Daniel Ennis. As usual, I'm joined by Dr. Janet Pope for another episode of Ask an Expert. But before we get into today's discussion, we do have a bit of housekeeping to do. So firstly, I want to give you all the good news. Janet will no longer be a guest on the show. She's actually graduated to being a co-host. Our second item is really what to expect from Around the Room going forward. So throughout the year, we're still going to do Ask an Expert episodes where we interview leading Canadian researchers and clinicians on their fields of study. Here are some of the topics that we're going to cover. Sjogren's disease, auto-inflammatory diseases, IgG4-related diseases. And what we would love is if you submit any questions that we will pose to the experts. If you have questions you'd like answered, please contact us through the CRA Twitter account, which is C-R-A-S-C-R Room, or by email at info at room.ca. We're also going to be putting together more French language and Indigenous peoples focused episodes. And here's a new idea that I'm pretty excited about as well. So one of my favorite sessions at the CRA annual meeting is the Clinical Pearls sessions where residents or fellows or staff present really challenging cases and help us work through the diagnostic process. And we want to do the same thing, but in podcast form. So if you have a challenging case, get in touch. Uh, we'll bring you onto the show as a guest, and you can present the case piece by piece for Janet and me, but mostly Janet to work through, uh, to work through, so that we can kind of try and model the clinical reasoning that an expert like Janet has developed over time. Of course, all the cases do require consent from patients, and we can help you sort that out if you're interested in participating. Again, get in touch through Twitter or email. I think that's going to be a lot of fun, and we're hoping to be able to chat with people from across the country. Okay, so on with today's discussion. Hello again, Janet. How are you doing? Very well and glad to be here, and I'm glad I've been promoted. Okay, yeah, me too. So I'm excited about today's topic because I definitely need your guidance. So I'm a relatively new staff, and I'm, I'm now pretty routinely working with trainees. But residency and fellowship don't really directly prepare you for taking over as being the staff. You certainly get a taste of who's a good teacher and who's a bad teacher, but that's mostly just personal preference. And I'd really appreciate your insights as someone who's mentored dozens of trainees. I really want to get a sense of how to be a better teacher and mentor. Does that sound like uh, your wheelhouse? Well, I can try. <laughs> okay. So so maybe just to set the table, I'd, I'd really like to get a sense of uh, going through training and maybe even now. Who are your mentors and who are your uh, favorite teachers uh, throughout? So, Daniel, that's a pretty tough question because <laughs> when you, you sort of look, you, you wonder, who are you going to leave out? My grade eight math teacher <laughs> I love, <laughs> Mrs. Godwin. See, I still know her name. Um, but I think uh, going through med school, I, I think my my biggest influence mentors in med school were actually the, the more senior people in, in training. So the residents, I thought the senior resident or even the PGY1 when I was a med student knew so much. And then the chief resident was really like brilliant. So I think that they had a lot of hands-on teaching and you could model after them their enthusiasm and uh, probably their compassion as well because you saw it. Whereas, well, in training, it was difficult to really know what the staff people were thinking about so much because they just kind of, in a way, parachuted in and out. As I went on to uh, internal medicine, uh, the role models were really um, people that were in rheumatology. I thought, wow, the patients are so thankful. They seem to have compassion. They seem to have time to listen. And uh, they didn't look as stressed out or as sleep deprived as, say, the ICU doctors and things. So a shout out really would be to uh, Nicole Arish and John Thompson back then. Then moving forward, uh, I did my rheumatology in Boston at BU. So Dave Felsen was quite an influence. I think he saw in me something that I didn't because there was no way in heck I was going to be a researcher. And I maybe he misunderstood and thought I would be. So I think <laughs> he pushed me in a good way. Um, he can be... Uh, he can really be very frank in what he says, but I appreciated the, the frankness. So everything wasn't just great. It's like now sometimes when we evaluate trainees, we say great means okay, and excellent means right. pretty good. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so so maybe early on, your your mentors and teachers were really more modeling the behavior. And then later on, it was more kind of like career guidance and actually learning the 
the content skills of uh, of the of the profession in a way. You know, I, you've worked with so many people over time. I'm wondering if you see a difference between being a teacher uh, and being a mentor. Are those distinct to you? I think they are distinct. So you can have a lot of wonderful teachers and um, they can be very segmented as a, for instance, somebody that is a superb clinician on physical exam skills, someone else kind of teaching you life lessons. So you might be uh, together with uh, someone else in clinic, but you're still getting a life lesson as to, you know, here's what we have to understand on the socioeconomic status of this person and how it's going to really influence their health behaviors and their health outcomes. So there are people that are really quite um, astute that way. There's also uh, teachers that will, um, I think, help you w- work the system, work the ropes. But I think a lot of people like that, that latter thing, are really more likely to be mentors or role models because that's a difference too. Yeah. When I was thinking of this question, I, I kind of thought that teachers are, are people who kind of, they, they teach me content or they teach me an item and then they then they fade back into the mist. And a mentor is someone who's kind of, of course, they're they're always going to be doing some degree of teaching. But it really has that longitudinal relationship to it. Um, and I kind of think about the the people I've worked with through training and lots of great teachers and lots of great mentors, but they've kind of played different roles at different times uh, on my end, at least. Absolutely. And yeah, I think you have to look for it too, Daniel, that sometimes it's there. And if you nudge a person a little bit more, um, you can get more advice if you need it. And you will have, we've talked sometimes before about this, you will have different needs at different times. And also there's usually not one superhuman that can help you in um, what's going on in your life, balancing the office, how to bill, um, how do you be a great clinician and time management at work? They, they're different people can help you in different ways. Right. You kind of have to assemble your your own team, right? Your own Power Ranger team to um, uh, to to kind of cover all that territory. And, and you're right. I'm not sure that there's always going to be or should be one person that does all of that. But, but really assembling that team, I, I did find not not the easiest as I went through training or it, it did ultimately organically happen, but I found it difficult to actually pursue and secure mentorship early on. I think perhaps maybe because I just didn't know what I wanted. So then you don't really know what questions to ask. But um, do you have any thoughts on um, how you actually kind of approach people to be a mentor without just saying, hey, you want to be my mentor? Hey, you want to be my friend? So I think, first of all, it, it's not, there's nothing wrong with asking and it, you don't have to ask it. Um, you know, it's not like going steady and then you're getting engaged. It's sort of, can we do a bit of speed dating first? So you could really say something like, um, you know, here's what I admire about how you practice or how you balance work life or whatever it is, or, or you seem to understand the system because if you're in an academic system of what I need to do at this level and to get eventually promoted or to, um, you know, have opportunities that are interesting in my career. You seem to understand that. So if you say something that's a compliment, but it's true or you wouldn't ask them, um, could, do you mind sitting down and uh, telling me the ropes? And if it doesn't work out, that's fine. It's just a one-off and stuff. So you'd be surprised how, how many people go, uh, okay, I'm super busy, but sure. I'll, okay. So right. let's, you know, and you schedule it or they'll say something like, well, after clinic, why don't we just, uh, you know, have a coffee in the days where we could have our masks off and right. uh, talk, shoot the breeze. So those things do happen, but you, you can, um, see if it fits. And um, I've sometimes mentored people where I probably wouldn't have chosen them to be to be the mentees in that, oh, this is a trainee where we don't share a lot in common, I don't understand the research, and I'm not sure about their goals and objectives for the future, or they seem um, disorganized, and I need I need somebody organized, because my time is only I only have so much. And yet it's worked out fantastically over time. So it's not always, um, you know, the, the it's not always the cover of the book that really will help you. But you're always yeah. looking for someone to sort of say, you've been there, done that. How do you make it easier? Or how for my patients? What are how do I remember all this stuff? How do I get access to this for someone that needs coverage? And you'll find people that will um, direct you and and 
you will then in some of the in some ways make some of these a more permanent lasting relationship that is uh, mutual they always say mentorship is there's something in it for the mentor and the mentee and i think that's the same with um a teaching relationship where it's um far broader than just uh uh, I'm going to teach this one hour of lecture and off you go. I think during fellowship, you you probably have um, a half day clinic. A lot of people do where it's the same uh, staff they're with a lot. And I think part of the role of the staff there is to help the person. And what do you need? And how can I hook you up with the things you'll need? So is it I can find a senior secretary that will tell you when you get hired somewhere or I can um, introduce you to someone because you want to work in Whitby, et cetera. Right. So on the other side of this, then, so that that's kind of like um, students or trainees finding a mentor. How about you as, as someone who's often a mentor? Do you ever kind of parachute in and <laughs> solicit it or otherwise become someone's mentor or decide that that they should become your mentee? Uh, yes, yes. And also within that, there's also peer to peer. So sometimes I think... Um, in peers, you know, say plus minus five years of when I uh, graduated, sometimes I'm possibly directing them and okay, here's how you do the dossier, because this is what you need to get to the next level, say it's a promotion, or, um, you know, this paper is always rejected, here's what I would do in advance. So those little sort of, again, pearls, uh, academic right. pearls, but vice versa, I might say, have you ever encountered um that this situation has happened and how did you handle it? So that sort of peer to peer stuff is really helpful, but certainly sometimes when someone's struggling, uh, albeit whether it's a PGY uh, three and they're struggling on what career choice should they have, or uh, they've had an illness in the family or something like that. I think being attuned, you can sometimes almost say, you know, if you, you if you want to talk and talk through this, or how can we get you to the next level? Uh, some people think that, you know, I could be a, a mom, but a tough one, like, I'm not just all this is all great. And <laughs> you're a great person. <laughs> it's like, well, you got to pull up your socks. So um, sometimes for the 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 trainees, and these are usually I am talking about med students, or the PGY one twos, I'm not talking about the fellows here or anything. Um, if someone's struggling, they just put them in my clinic. Because I can uh, kind of along the way, usually at the end of the day, say, here's what you did. Well, it's all sandwich, right? And but I, I sense you're not all here. Is there things we can do to help? So I feel I can say that. Whereas Daniel, it'd be more difficult for you if someone the age difference isn't that great. If you're going to be talking to an intern and they say, but but you could be like my big brother, but not that old a big brother. I could be <laughs> like your mom. So I think sometimes it's helpful, and I think they realize that. You know, we've we've at a certain level. I won't say I've seen it all. Thank heavens, I haven't seen all horrendous things. But we've we've seen lots of different issues in trainees that are usually resolved. They need coaching. They need mm -hmm. more help for something, or they just need someone to talk to. We have people that come. You know, during COVID, PGY one, they've never even stepped foot in the London hospitals. That's tough right. for them when they come on the first service. So yeah. again, some of it's guidance, some of it's coaching, but some of it they they become over time, someone that if they do email it's or and say, I need to talk, it's like, sure, I'll make the time, whether it's email or we'll, we'll just phone and FaceTime, Zoom, whatever. Yeah. So, so you, you kind of uh, talked us through how you deal with struggling trainees. I wonder a bit of an odd question, perhaps, but what about challenging trainees? So ones that maybe um, are, are, are harder to get along with, or maybe that are not a good fit. Um, for the clinic or, or interpersonally, how do you manage those relationships? Well, first of all, it probably shows that I'm a little bit exasperated because <laughs> I, I don't mind. I don't mind someone who has a lack of knowledge, but ignorance as in I, I don't really care either about the patient or about respecting the clinic hours or whatever. I just I don't have patience for that. And I think it shows pretty quickly. Like I don't raise my voice or anything, but anyone around me would know she's not saying, <laughs> she's not so happy about this. So I try to have the benefit of the doubt. Always put yourself in someone else's shoes. What maybe, you know, I had a trainee and again, I'm, this is not giving away confidentiality because it'll be very vague and it's a long time ago, but there was a trainee that just came through for a month and uh, kind of was driving me a bit nuts and I thought was lazy and later found out that the partner had breast cancer. So, you know, there was lots going and a young person, right? So lots going on right. at home. And as soon as that happened, it clicked. 
It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you can have slack. There's something here that's a, a pretty big deal. And I think it just resets the whole relationship and, uh, you know, respecting each other's time and things like that. So that's just an example of where I was I was very frustrated. Uh, and it, as I say, it's a long time ago. It's not anything that uh, any group listening to this would ever know anything about. So but there are people that like, um, as I say, I, lack of knowledge doesn't bother me because you can always learn and we all learn in different ways and at different paces. But when it's a lack, it's, it's an ignorance of lack of respect, uh, especially really for the, the fellow workers, for the trainees, maybe for the admin. The admins always know if you ever want to know someone's true character, ask the administrative secretary and yeah. uh, they'll tell you a thing or two. That That's the same pearl. Same pearl out here. Occasionally, you'll have a, a trainee where they really they're checked out. And they're sometimes checked out because they already have matched. So the PGY3s that are going to do GI or ICU or something, <laughs> they might, or cardiology, they might be pretty checked out. So usually after clinic or before and confidentially, you just bring them in a room that's, that it's not obvious. They say, can, can I just see you in the exam room for a second? So usually I might say something to the fact of, uh, you match, you know what, that's excellent. But here's what you need. You need to get the Royal College exam. So why don't we just go from there and you should make this the challenge of what do you need to know about rheumatology emergencies, etc. And that's how you should value this rotation. So I'm trying to put the words in their mouth to get them to uh, reset. The, and, and sometimes it's just like, well, I don't care. And they don't say it that way, but they're on the phone when you're talking to them. It's kind of body language speaks pretty loudly. <laughs> right. Okay. That That's actually really helpful. You know, I, I'm wondering if we can now kind of get into a little bit more nitty gritty. I'm wondering what you found to be successful strategies as a teacher. So what do you actually do in clinic uh, to to get your learners from great to excellent? Right. So again, everyone has a different style. And um, I must say, I hardly ever ask them things like, what's your differential diagnosis? I feel that that, things like that can be done perhaps aside from bedside teaching. And because my clinic's wild and in in number and we're always behind, there's a lot going (laughs) on. I feel the thing that's best is I can, when we're not in COVID, that I can do bedside teaching. So I almost always will... um, you know, ask, what did you see? And then point out things because the, the thing that turns a lot of people onto rheumatology is the physical exam skills. So they go, you know, this history, I don't know what it is, but you walk in the room and tell me what it is because we all, right. You see the leukocytic classic vasculitis, you feel the nodules, whatever it is. Um, so trainees usually really like that. And we do a lot of injections and we just do them at bedside without ultrasound. So I think getting um, to feel comfortable with injections, I think they love it. So that would be probably where I concentrate then more at the end of a clinic or where there's time um, to more organically say, you know, you saw a patient with RA, you saw Whipples and you saw IgG4. So by the way, you got to know about <laughs> RA. <laughs> the other ones That's are quite- too rare. <laughs> That's quite a clinic. <laughs> right, exactly. So you, you try to sort of go and then, you know, what what would you think? What would we do next? And and also you got to put it at their level. It's not to, um, I'm not going to ask a medical student the side effect of a jack inhibitor uh, or an intern yeah. or the person that's doing ICU next year. So you, I, you try to gear it at their interest. So if someone loves GI, I'll often say, well, what are the GI manifestations? We just saw this person with scleroderma and she had some, but what else would you think about asking? Mm-hmm. Right? It makes it relevant. Right. So you try and so you try and do teaching around cases for, at the bedside. You're doing bedside teaching because you actually have the, the opportunity there. You're targeting things to level and you're targeting things to to interest. I, you know, I, I'm going to share some of the teaching tips. I Before this this discussion, I asked some of our colleagues locally um, who I think are kind of masterful teachers and I asked for their teaching tips. I'm going to run them by you and you then the new comment. So right. Um, and just if you didn't ask them, they weren't mad. They, they were masterful. You just didn't get around to it. <laughs> that's it, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, the ones I bumped into. So one was to ask learners for specific objectives for the rotation at the very beginning of the rotation to give and solicit direct, clear feedback and three, encourage residents to reflect on their learning um, throughout and then at the end of the rotation. What do you think of those as kind of big ticket items? 
Right. So I think sometimes the trainee's objective is, you know, I want to pass the exam, but it's three years from now, so I won't remember <laughs> anyway, right? So right. I think that makes sense if you have a, a, a trainee that, you know, came out of engineering. So they're really yeah. organized, they have a, a plan, and they, the, the mechanics of it are in their brain. But I think a lot of people say, I, I, I don't know, I don't even know, this is a black box. I just right. want to come in and, and make my way through it and come out where the box is grayer so I can kind of see better through it. So yeah. I don't mind that. I just don't do that style. Um, I think the clear and concise, or it doesn't have to be concise, but clear feedback is a skill. It is a skill. And that's why it's always easier to say, ah, oh, you did great. But you know, that that's not constructive feedback to someone. We can say great job and you tried really hard. That's that is really that's helpful and that's a bit of coaching too. But I think the next level of coaching or teaching or feedback would be um sometimes I'll ask the trainee, what do you think what or or the the colleague even, what do you think went right? What do you think went wrong? And then what do you think I could do better? How do you think I or the clinic or our group uh, would be able to make this experience better for you? Because I already know the answer yeah. sometimes is give me more time in between. Yeah. I want a two hour lunch. And, yeah, sure. but, but some of it is more time to read around cases. We, we all want the two hour lunch. Um, I That's a really good point because I think giving feedback is hard because I don't like making people unhappy or less happy than they already are. Uh, that that's maybe just me. And I kind of also hope that there's implicit feedback when we go over a case and I change something that they did, or we review a physical exam and I disagree, or, you know, I, I have an, an alternative view of it. I hope that that's implicit feedback, but it isn't explicit. And I can certainly see how pointing that out and making it very clear that you're about to get feedback. <laughs> this is feedback here's what I saw in your physical exam. This is how it was different. And what I want you to work on is kind of bridging the gap between the two. Maybe that is a way to kind of round out the implicit feedback that happens when I do, you know, case reviews or bedside teaching. Um, reflecting on on what what you've learned, I, I know that that derives from some of the the higher level medical education research that you and I aren't really getting into today. What do you think about that? Do you think that having them reflect and, and really kind of solidify the lessons from the clinic or, or at least kind of be mindful of what they just learned today. Does that, does that um, ring true as a useful tool to you? I think it does when someone's not been on like five days of call, like you know, <laughs> two, three days because other people are on holidays and recovering medicine, then they're right. reflecting on where do I get dinner? Would you? Would you? <laughs> so, but I think uh, you, you made a really good point there of making the, making it explicit. Like I, I do a lot of teaching to the trainee when I'm talking to the patient. And if mm -hmm. the trainee pulls out their phone or comes away, like don't, don't move out of the conversation. So sometimes <laughs> I'll actually stop because especially a patient I know, well, I'll stop yeah. and I'll say, actually, I'm going into more detail because this is for Dr. X as well, or, mm -hmm. you know, whomever. Right. Uh, and then they wake up. Oh, okay. That's for me. And I think explicitly when you leave the room, it's like, I, I want you to listen because it's not just the way I talk to the patient. It's the content is at a patient level, but it's more detailed than they need because it's for you. And then they go, Oh, okay. I'll pay attention. Cause they don't always realize. And right. I think you're right to call out to say, uh, this is teaching because um, if you read your feedback for any of the people that are in the academic centers, the evaluations don't just like, oh, she's great. We love them, blah, blah, blah. Look at also what people say, because sometimes people say, you know, they didn't have time. Uh, I got no teaching. It felt like all service. Then you have to remind them that, yes, there is service. But by the way, I'm probably more efficient without you. I would never say that. But you have to <laughs> remind them that you're actually some of what you're doing with them, that this we're going to go into the room and I'm going to teach you as we review the case. And yeah. they go, oh, OK, because if you prime, they they find some of those pearls. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the the way that I give feedback, I think, is a little bit flavored by just the here's here's what I've what I've noticed is that when I, you know, used to get feedback on each of my rotations, the only rotation that I remember the, the feedback explicitly is the one where I got really negative feedback, right? Like out of, out of all like the, the good rotations, the only one I really remember is the bad one. 
Yes. And so I kind of think about that, that I don't want the resident to leave the rotation or, uh, you know, leave clinic just focusing on like the one thing that went poorly as opposed to like the 99 things that went really well. And so I, I at least internally, I'm trying to like balance that, that uh, component of things. I definitely want them to, hey, if you're doing amazing at something, then I guess that needs less work. Obviously, the thing you should focus on is the thing that didn't go so well. But I don't want it to um, deflate um, someone's successes. I think it's framing, though, Daniel, that you um, and and we all we all it's way easier to say someone's great even when they're not, but especially when they <laughs> yeah. are. But right. framing is um, because I, I agree that the people that um, were where you were either challenged in the rotation or I'm challenged, say, with the trainee or something like that. Um, you do remember some of that that friction. But mm-hmm. don't they always say we learn best from our losses, not from our successes? They do, or yes. you do at least. And I think yeah. it's probably true. So yeah. I think the framing would be, um, you know, you're a trainee, obviously you're passing the rotation and I wish you the best of luck in the future. However, looking at today, I think you were checked out. You're probably post calls or anything else going on. Um, and what do you think went right? And what do you think where, what do you think pondering this, where maybe you could have done better on that case where like you told me they had nothing and they had rip roaring right. RA as a, for instance, right? Um, right. So those sorts of things, and they it's a framing because then they have to self-reflect and say it. And most people, if they think deeply enough, it's um, they realize like, oh, I missed the boat. And I go, well, I, don't, I didn't expect you to know about the drugs or the even the workup. But sometimes to not listen to what the patient told you and pursue yeah. that, you can miss something, right? You make right. it that they they're pointing it out, I guess, and we aren't. And but and again, that takes time. And it takes that you care about getting this training through because sometimes you just want them through. Out to go. Goodbye. We love you, bud. Yeah, that's right. We'll be right back to Around the Room after this brief message from the CRA. Did you know that membership with the Canadian Rheumatology Association offers outstanding value through knowledge sharing, accredited educational offerings, advocacy, and research support? Members receive access to free webinars, programs, and discounts to events such as the CRA Review Course and Annual Scientific Meeting. Members also receive complimentary subscriptions to the Journal of Rheumatology and the Journal of the Canadian Rheumatology Association. Trainees can join for free and are eligible for educational and training opportunities, travel bursaries, and much more. These are just some of the many benefits of joining the Canadian Rheumatology Association. And if you're an existing member, spread the word to rheumatology colleagues who haven't joined yet. They'll thank you for it. For more information, please visit our website at www.room.ca. And now, back to Around the Room. Okay, I, you know, back to mentorship for a moment. One of uh, my other colleagues out here, uh, who is who is one of my mentors, pointed out something really important. So they said... It's really important to listen to our trainees and align the training or mentorship to what the learner wants rather than what we want. And part of that point is being aware of our own personal biases. And I, I, I'm, I'm really kind of preoccupied by that when I talk to some of the, the senior trainees who are maybe soliciting some suggestion of like, hey, like, you know, I'm thinking of doing extra training. Like, what should I go into? And it's, it's hard to get out of my own head about the things that I enjoy. And and so those are the things I'm passionate about. So, you know, why wouldn't you also be passionate about it? But to give advice or direction that is aligned with what their skills and interests are, I, I find that to be challenging. What do you think of that? I think it is challenging. And I think you have to also realize that sometimes you have to say, well, you want to do room nephro. Well, good luck. It doesn't exist and you'll never get a job. Right. Like if they're really out there on something like that, that that's kind of interesting, but it's not going to happen. Or um, I want to do only this rare disease, but I want to work in the community and you go, well, that's great, but you're not going to get those referrals. Or right. don't we have, or I want to do uh, this other thing. You go, well, again, we've got four and the, 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 we don't have enough for the fifth. So you, you sometimes have to, um, ground it in a bit more um, reality because there's nothing wrong with pursuing um, 
interest knowledge training for the sake of training but don't think that if you're passionate about something or not even passionate you kind of like it and want to explore it that it's going to necessarily lead to a job it won't hurt and always having more skills um, makes you more round well-rounded might make you more hireable even if it's not in that area that it might get hired it shows that you've got the dedication to or the gumption to keep going and uh, pursue other things and that you love learning or what have you so I think if you do it that way it's like you know what what really don't you like you could ask a trainee that's thinking of something else or you know you've got a partner so you have to go to this city so here's who I think would be the top three areas where we could try to help you get there if you need the introduction we can't go beyond that right so sometimes because again if they say well we have to go to um, city um, xyz and they don't have what you want there you go well that maybe you should train on something else or leave a part <laughs> right. or something so you you i think right. you should be practical but but again like if someone says to me i want to train in something and i go oh my gosh like there's no, we have no hope for the patients and <laughs> you won't get grants on it it's like crazy um you go well that could be your minor what do you want for your major uh, i see so you know it, it sounds like to a degree kind of the place to start in in some of these mentorship relationships is being a good listener and uh kind of trying to internalize and sift through what the trainee is is really looking for um and distilling down like okay well they said this but but underneath that what they are really aiming at is this other thing this is the broader concept and that's something i can actually help you get to and then kind of giving advice targeted to them but based in reality um it seems like maybe some some broad scaffolding on right, which to right. be practical scaffolding and also yeah. sometimes it, it depends on how well the trainee knows you at the beginning of a mentor, mentorship relationship sometimes they're saying what they think you want to hear like i want to be yeah. an academic yeah. because then you'll give me a good mark you'll give me a paper so i can get you right whatever uh you have to realize so sometimes you just say like really you're telling me this but I don't think this is what you're going to be really interested in. Why don't you think there's a lot of things? There's quality assurance. Um, that quality is a big deal. There's, there's all sorts of other things where you can contribute that isn't what I know about, but maybe I can listen to how you go through it and help you along the way. Or again, hook you up with someone and then I, I could be the fall guy. I, that, I don't mind being the fall guy to <laughs> fall back. It doesn't work out. Come back. Yeah. Well, Janet, thank you so much. I think my trainees are going to be really happy that I got some tips from a master. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully I return to clinic a better teacher than I left yesterday. I think we'll, we'll leave it there for today. And thanks so much for joining us, Janet. Thanks, Daniel. And I look forward to our co-hosting. Me too. Yeah. Bye-bye. That's it for this episode of Around the Room. For questions, comments, and future episode ideas, email us at info at room.ca or tag our Twitter account with your question at C-R-A-S-C-R Room. Around the Room is produced by David McGuffin, Dr. Dax Rumsey, and Kevin Bajnoth. We would like to give a special thanks to the Communications Committee and the staff of the CRA for all their hard work. And of course, an extra special thanks to Dr. Janet Pope. Our theme music was composed by Aaron Fontwell. If you enjoyed your time with us, please give us a rating and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. You can also share this podcast with your colleagues and spread the word on social media. I'm Daniel Ennis. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.